again and welcome to Manch Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And last week I totally blew off the show because it was like oh. 7,000 degrees <laughs> below zero and I was like, nah, I don't think I'm leaving the house. Yeah, don't hate me. And you me. were in Miami. So I was I in wasn't... Miami. If it makes you feel better, it rained the entire time. It's still nice. And uh, But it was warm and it was really nice. It was an amazing conference. Uh, I had a really good time, met a lot of fancy uh, intellectuals, academics, yep. just cutting edge people. And it was, I mean, it was, it was awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm going to jump into this and I don't have it in front of me, but Dan showed it to me. On. So, you know, that, um, in Boston, they're testing the sewer water for COVID. Did you know that? Um, because I, it's not in the big news. You never see anything about it, but they've been testing the water because they think that's a way to track the actual surge, surge and, and everything it, yep. versus testing or anything because Testing results are only with people that are testing in a convenient, right? Well, Dan showed me the thing. It went straight up and whoop, straight down. And it is like crazy low the like the last two days, which is very encouraging because that means Omicron may have run, run through. Course, yeah. And we, I mean, uh, if we stop boosting people, because if well, we keep doing that, we're just going to get more and more variants. There I, was a really good article, I think it was on the Institute of something <laughs> i'm not gonna remember right now i didn't prepare to talk about it oh, sorry uh but it is on my twitter feed and i recommend that people go read it actually mm -hmm. one of the people at this conference was the found uh you know the guy the who guy developed the mrna yeah. technology who is an outspoken critic about this strategy yeah. and smart man interesting talk uh, you know, I'm not even going to say his name no, because, because then, then we we'll get, get <laughs> well, and I, banned, I'm, which just tells you everything you need to know. I just, I was, <laughs> when we were falling asleep last night, I was listening to a podcast or a, you know, TED talk or something. And I, I just happened to be listening, you know, I wasn't, I'm like, what are we listening to? Dan sound asleep. And it was, um, two guys, one guy from Israel interviewing a scientist who was, um, they were talking about MRNA virus, uh, vaccines and what they do and don't do. And. To be honest, the fact that six months later these vaccines seem to be not effective is exactly what they knew always, that that's how it was because your body dices them up. That's just a natural response. So they become, you know, they just become... Um, but the thing is, so, so we're so only looking at one side of the equation, right? So we're looking at the, can we uh, prevent... Uh, this from happening. Uh, we can't. It doesn't stop nope. the transmission. No. And, you know, and it's speculative at best whether it does reduce hospitalizations. That is something that um, people are being told. So I'm like, well, if you have something and someone told you it's going to make something milder, it might probably it, psychologically, it psychologically yeah. may actually yes. influence you. And then what we're not looking at on the other side is the potential side effects or long term harm, right? So I've seen two studies in the past week that say that for people under the age of 60, mm -hmm. you are better served to to stop, you know, and if you've had the ones you've had. <clears throat> Whatever, you can't go back, can't undo. It's fine, but you know, you have a choice going forward because the more you do it, the more you compromise your immune system. Yep. And so you don't really want to get into a situation where, you know, the next, uh, you know, the next... virus that they right. leak out of a lab that the U.S. government and DARPA have been paying for will uh, maybe come and get you. So I recommend it is the start of the new year and mm -hmm. people are probably doing some new year's resolutions mm -hmm. uh look at what you're eating here's here's a reality you know you can't fake health nope you can't fake it. It doesn't matter what you tell yourself. Oh, I'm a little overweight, but it doesn't matter. Oh, I'm pre-diabetic, but mm, you can't fake health. So if you are unhealthy, get yourself healthy. Mm -hmm. How can you do that? You can do things like changing your diet. Go yep. look. The get science is active. out there. Go for a walk every right. day. And you don't have to be like me no. where I'm like, I'm going to learn to surf. Right. Or, you know, I'm going to do, do Bikram yoga. You know Even go if for you a do walk anything, every day. just do something. Start with something. If you just go for a walk <laughs> Park for 20 minutes away, you know? every day, yep. you will actually, your mood will improve. You will become more uh, aware of the things you need to fix. And then you can fix yeah. them. You are in charge of your destiny. You, like, it's your life. And if you want to live it, make it count. You know, so this is a good transition, I think, to something you brought and I brought. So the mRNA vir vaccines, um, you know, did, may or may not have um, helped people 
with the severity of the symptoms. There's really no way to quantify that. You don't know. I don't know how, I had no way of knowing how severe the symptoms would be for me. So if you're back, but psychologically it might. So now I'm gonna flip it over. There was a story in the union leader front page today, which I've known about for well before I, so this goes back to the beginning of December. Right. So this is now, you know, six, seven weeks later. Um, former representative J.R. Hole who is a very outspoken, you know, on the rebuild, whatever, it doesn't matter. Very conservative, very outspoken against the mandates and things like that, which is irre- should be irrelevant to this discussion. Um, he, him and his family all had COVID over Thanksgiving. He had um, ivermectin. I'm going to say it. When, I was, when we had COVID, we took ivermectin. Maybe ivermectin doesn't work. I don't really care. If it made me think it was working and it made me feel better, who cares? It's not It's not a dangerous drug. It's a dangerous drug if you ate like 20 of them, you know, like anything is, right? So he gave his family ivermectin. Dare is a, res- outside of politics, I don't have to like him or hate him or whatever. He is a responsible parent. Him and his wife are good people, good parents. They're not going to do anything to their children that's going to cause them harm. And they took ivermectin. They got over it quickly. A while. As did everyone who took ivermectin. Um, Very suspicious. Well, it did take me a good two plus weeks, so fair enough. So who knows, right? But again, who, everybody's different. Um, but the um, DCYF came to his door and wanted to take his children away from him because he had gone to the emergency room because I, they thought maybe his son had taken too much Tylenol. This is well after the ivermectin is no longer even in his system. Uh, They tested him, he didn't have too much Tylenol. There was nothing actually wrong. They sent him home. It was like a week or 10 days later that DCYF shows up at their door because a nurse practitioner reported that they had taken ivermectin. Okay, let me remind you that there's a seven-year-old child that is missing that DCYF failed to even check in on for two years. Can, can I just interrupt you for two seconds there with that story? Now, I have been missing, so I haven't been reading all the, the paper as, as you know, attentively as I usually yeah. do. But I found it extremely suspicious that this child is suddenly plucked out of whatever narrative the day after the Lori's List dropped. We had one news cycle, literally one article about the Lori's List, yeah. the exculpatory evidence schedule that came out where it was listed, which police officers oh, I see are saying. on it. And then the next day there was this missing child and now it's well, front page news every day. I, where was that story for two years? Well, if, I think they are literally with PR trying to suppress that by just making this look at us story. I, I, I have read more. There's only so much you can read about it. Um, and it isn't coincidental, I'm not saying it's not coincidental, but um, the mom who doesn't know where her daughter is, who, you know, had the child taken away, you know, she's fully aware of her faults too. Um, there is a timeline goes back because she had another child who has been adopted and those parents were encouraging her to seek out where her daughter was so that that daughter's brother could have a relation and it, and it festered in the, I, I do mm. feel bad for the woman. She has been like, hello, could somebody help me? Hello, could somebody help me? Hello, somebody find my child. Mm. And, finally, and then just the yeah. next day, they, they be, magically, this becomes it the is story. From the DCYF p- perspective, they're going after J.R. Hole, who has a son who has no medical condi- problems right now because six weeks ago, it, it, it's it's our insane. perspective seems wrong. I'm and, sorry. And can we just also unpack some things there? So we'll start with why is a nurse practitioner contacting DCYF about a parent's decision to medicate their own child with a medicine that won the Nobel Prize that's been around, I don't know, since like the 70s. And, and is the it problem not? is it was we made it so ivermectin is not approved in the United States by the FDA for treatment for COVID. Which which is a whole nother long nonsense. discussion about why the FDA is doing these things. If they're if it's not gonna harm you, right? If I take Tylenol for a headache, there's no harm. Oh, I'll from. tell you why, because Fauci is not making ten point right, right. four million dollars off Ivermectin. So you end up with you know, you end up the 
the laws in New Hampshire require everybody if they suspect any child abuse or neglect, which is a bit much of a burden, to be honest, to put on me, an individual, to have to be held liable if I don't report to to the state what I think might be. So you've got nurse nurse practitioners and doctors and all these people that are hyper I mean, it sounds sensitive. very political to me. It is, well, with JR's situation, it is 100% political. They are going after him because he is anti-vaccine and he is anti-mandate and anti-closing down our businesses and all that stuff. So now it's like, I my gut tells me that's exactly what it is. It's like, aha, and now we're going to go after you. But that's not what I pay taxes for, and that's not what you pay taxes for, and this is inappropriate, and I call bullshit. Sorry, I said bullshit on TV twice. Well, but, the, <laughs> but and, and that is the issue, right? So one of the things that happens when you have too much control <clears throat> And we create these opportunities for people to to try and you know do these kinds mm-hmm. of things. Is you create more and more opportunities for people to take things and politicize them. Mm-hmm. This is ridiculous. Well, and it's clearly a witch. And he's in. He's. It's costing him tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees. And that's part of it. Is this like you have to wonder? Is this it? Like somebody's going, oh well, it's never going to amount to anything. anything. We're not going to take his kids. But meanwhile, he'll have to spend all this money on legal fees. Oh, so, often, right? Because that is the problem when you fight the state. The state is all powerful and has unlimited resources. And you, the little guy, if you actually fight back, it is astronomically yep. expensive. I mean, yep. that lady with the right to know yep. stuff, which Spence. we'll talk about in a second, yep. has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to get information that should be publicly available. So if for some reason you would like to help JR and his family with their legal costs and whatnot, um, you can Google, if you simply Google JR Hole and his last name is spelled H-O-E-L-L and I Googled GoFundMe because I didn't know it came right up. It's actually givesandgo.com, G-I-V-E-S and spelled out A-N-D-G-O.com slash help JR. Um, they've raised a lot of money. Um, they continue to raise money in, uh, you know, It's not something that shouldn't be. Um, You wanted to talk about some right to know stuff. Yeah, so um, I don't have all the bill numbers and everything, but we do have, uh, there's six right to know bills coming up this week. In hearing um, or on the floor? In uh, hearing, hearing. I believe. uh, So today's, is today the 19th? Today's the 18th, so tomorrow, Wednesday. So tomorrow, Wednesday, there's um, HB 1013. In <laughs> my own notes. I'm like, I think Wednesday. that's why you were Wednesday. <laughs> um, so I guess today <laughs> is HB 1036, which we uh, write to know New Hampshire, which is just a nonpartisan citizens accountability group. We're just a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. We're from the left, right, center, mm-hmm. independents, libertarians, the whole them. thing. All we care about is how can we make government more open so that government becomes more accountable. Because Mm -hmm. here's the thing, you can't hold people accountable if you don't know what they're doing, which is why they like to keep secrets from us. So today's uh, is 1036. This has to do with non-public meetings. So Mm. non-public meetings in New Hampshire are being abused, Mm -hmm. right? And, um, And what they tend to do now is when they are discussing a person, they take it into non-public meeting, but they don't necessarily notify the person. So this bill, which uh, Right to Know supports, would um, allow New Hampshire citizens, if they're going to be discussed in a non-public meeting, they have to get notification, (laughs) they have the right to participate, and they have the right to ask that the meeting become a public meeting. Right, because if it's about... If it's about By me, you, why can't I say right? no, no, no? It's yep. just like a jury of your peers or versus yep. a judge. I can say no, 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 I want to do this. Right. So um, so I think that's a great bill. Mm, I, I can't like imagine that. why anyone would be against it unless you're, you know, uh, hiding something. So hopefully that'll go uh, in our favor. Tomorrow, there are a few bills. There's HB 1013. Uh, this has to do with remote meetings. And the mm. organization, uh, Right to Know, decided they were going to oppose this. Um, 
I think it's mostly to do with the language of stuff. I have to say I'm a little torn because there is a part of me that actually does like the idea of using tech to make it easier on the citizens. Yes. So what I would love to see is kind of a hybrid mm. develop where state legislators, because they work for us, should go to the state house mm -hmm. because they can mingle and do all there of that. There is a true benefit to being and, an Aaron Right, person. and then, you know, if people want to actually be able to give their testimony online, maybe we can make something there. Yeah, I'm a, I, I agree. There, people conflate I think two different two different things. You've got uh, the Democrat Party pr primarily saying they believe that elected officials, elected state reps and senators shouldn't have to go to the state house to participate in their role as elected officials. They should just be able to stay home and do it via Zoom. That's one issue. And then there's this issue where should you, the citizen, be able to testify to a committee remotely. Now, I, I don't think this bill actually does that. That was just my right. personal opinion. Right. So this bill, I think we're opposing is because they just literally wanted to say that if there's a rare disease, we can do everything remotely. Yeah. Now we've learned over the past two years, words matter, yep. uh, where you cede your right. rights really does right. matter. And so you can't just be like, all right, who's gonna define a rare, a rare disease? Right. Because so I am still waiting for someone to define emergency yeah. because you know we did all of this stuff under the emergency laws and if there was no all-cause mortality then what was the emergency or if the all-cause mortality was as high as in 2017 in a bad flu year then why wasn't that an emergency right. so you know i think we have work to do the other one to uh on wednesday or no th this is on thursday we have four so there's HB 1195. That one we are supporting with an amendment. And um, this had to do, actually, I don't know because my notes are very confusing. <laughs> You're like me, I got um, chicken scratch. But, but I do know on Thursday there are a bunch and it's gonna be like a whole day also on Thursday. Something. And you can watch the hearings now, which is nice. You that can watch nice. committee. Right, so I like to, I. I feel like um, I was just having this conversation with a, a very much involved person last night, and I said, you know, keeping up with what's going on at the state house is an, you have to consciously oh, yeah. get involved because it would require driving to Concord to sit in on a hearing or read through all, the whole calendars and all the journals and all that. Or and now, I can watch, like while I'm at work, I can put it on and be like, oh, that's interesting. Right. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's interesting. And, and that I makes feel it more, more participatory. It does. Right? It makes and me as a citizen more informed to know what it is that my elected officials are asked to vote on. So another one that is a plus, you know, I'm going to find all the positives here for us folks, is uh, the Ombudsman Bill. Yes. Uh, so this would be a body that is going to be created in New Hampshire that would be run by a lawyer. And the idea would be that we could take right to know requests to the Ombudsman instead of having to sue in court. Mm -hmm. If you still want to sue in court, you, could, you can, but, then, but for a nominal fee, you can take it to this arbiter who will then, I think it's like $25, right, he, who will then say, well, you know what? Yeah, if we have a list somebody, of bad cops, you know, right. maybe people should know who right. those people are. It's almost like what we should have more of in our court system, especially in small claims and in civil actions. You know, if you could, if there was just a third party that was, it doesn't necessarily be binding, but highly leaning towards binding, they're gonna to recommend to the judge that this happen, kind of like what we do with marital masters and divorces. You know, if you sit down and I'm suing you, and it's and you're completely wrong, <laughs> you, well, wouldn't you rather have somebody early on look at you right. and say, you don't, you're wrong. Well, well, you know, just to sideline for a little second, that is actually what's wrong with the American legal system. So in most other common law countries, uh, including Britain and South Africa, they, uh, they have this notion that if you bring a bum case, like if you bring a bad case, then lawyers' fees are automatically assigned to the party. So if I sue right. you For and I'm just like, 
crazy I'm going to sue you because you did it. And it's and, like, okay. And and so as, a, you know, my lawyer is supposed to tell me, you don't have no. a case, Carla. Right. So don't sue Tammy. Right. Because if you sue her You're and gonna you pay lose, her fees. the judge is going to pay yeah. make you pay her yeah. legal fees. That has always been a, a, a control valve on mm -hmm. lawsuits. Crazy America was just like, and this is the lawyer's fault, and I will say this joke, what do you call a thousand lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. A good start. <laughs> is um, we don't work that way here, and I think that's a flaw. It is. Um, so with this ombudsman bill, a lot of liberty activists at least have been in two minds about it, right? Because on the one hand, it's like, oh no, now Creating we're a growing another. government. We're gonna create a new thing. But you know, if you look at where government has grown, I think we failed actually by not growing the judiciary or not hmm. trying to deal with this stuff. We claim we're a nation of laws and that we have rule of law, um, but you know, less than 5% of cases actually go to court. Right. We are literally processing and you know, suing right. and uh, criminalizing all this stuff. And, and I think more people should have their day in court. So the Ombudsman Bill, which we have been pushing for at least four years, mm -hmm. uh, has finally, it came straight off the consent calendar, it came out of the House, so it's going to the Senate. So if you're watching this and you're passionate about this, let your senators know, mm -hmm. we think this will be a good deal. Um, I think we can find someone who, who can balance the needs of you know open, yep. transparent government with the handful of things where it's like, oh, you know what? Maybe you don't need to know this person's social security right. number or, or whatever. Or maybe there's an ongoing investigation that you're not aware of. Right. Like, and we're just gonna like do this. Right, so so I am uh, cautiously optimistic, yep. Yep. not aesthetically pessimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic that this one is actually gonna go through this time. Uh, the ombudsman, it's gonna be a paid job. Uh, yep. You know, it's gonna, someone's gonna have a real job. And, um, and I'm hopeful we can actually use that to start to truly, whoops, make New Hampshire the most open yeah. government yeah. in the world. Yeah. Why not, right? right? Like every time we have a right to know request that is fulfilled. So someone says, gee, I wanna know this. They're like, yeah, you could totally know that. So here it is. Why don't we take that information and create yeah. an open source repository so we make everything over time and that helps, accessible And to that people. makes it so that if you've already done a right to know request with this information, a month later, I'm not doing the same right to know request, which they do take time on the government employee side. Mostly because they're but, redacting things they shouldn't. But I'm just saying, okay. no matter what right. it is, why, why, why create duplicate? work if it's already been put out there? Why would the government silly, duplicate silly. work? Um, I do want to mention one thing. Well, it's a two-part thing. So this gentleman, Scott Godzik, he's a realtor here, lives in Manchester. He's got a Facebook page that's called What's Going On Manchester NH. And what he does is he posts the prior overnight police um, log to sh let people know this is what happened while you were sleeping last night, right? Of course, because they uh, encrypted the police scanners right, and we have no we idea what's know. happening last in Last night's city. was rather bizarre because there was an alarm at pretty much every school in the city. So I'm sure that was, I, I wonder what the heck that was about. But regardless, Probably a drill. Um, the reason I think this is, that is important. It's another important step towards this idea is last Saturday night, um, I see on Facebook that Andy Sylvia, who is a reporter for Manchester Inkling, he does the grocery hunt. Super nice he, guy. A really nice guy, um, does a ton of work. I don't know how much money he makes, but he, he is everywhere, everywhere right? <laughs> nice guy, no reason. He was assaulted oh, no. near Concord and Elm. So that's right across the street from the Jubble Tree, kind of near Veterans Park. Doesn't say right on Elm, so somewhere in there. He was assaulted by two individuals. They stole his phone. He ended up with a broken rib and oh, no. staples in his knee. And I thought, why Hi. don't I, if I didn't know Andy Sylvia or wasn't following Manchester Ink Link on Facebook, I would have no idea that this individual at 5.15 at night, we're not talking this was one o'clock in the morning. This is- Assault is- Assault. <laughs> I don't not know. acceptable any time of the day. Right, but this, <laughs> it seems even more bizarre that you could you could be near Elm Street at 5.15 on a Saturday night. It's That's not an unusual time and be assaulted by two people. 
I, I don't know if the right down the stairs meant know. that it was here, but if that's the case, it, it was, was here. here. So, right outside so, the building that we're in. How crazy is that? So that to me is shocking. And you know, Tammy, I have to say, I come from a very lawless country yep. that has had some super dodgy, you know, socioeconomic problems. And it just, it really genuinely breaks my heart. One of the things we, uh, at this conference I was at, I met a, a brilliant man. His name is Michael Schellenberger. He's an author. He writes a lot on uh, environmentalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but his new book is called San Francisco. Yes. And the subtitle is, how progressives ruin cities. Now it was interesting because it was a very Silicon Valley vibe. Yeah. I felt like the old lady with my like dot com stories from 2000, you know. Um, but uh, th basically, what the, the what he the conclusion he comes to in the book is uh, we can't keep like just allowing everything these to things keep going, to right? happen. And and he didn't give this example, but I was talking to Louis, I'm only halfway through, but I was like, you know, he's kind of saying we, we have this weird permissiveness with regard to behavior that, so by way of example, you know, one of the questions was, could you force someone who had committed a crime into a drug treatment program. So this is someone who's addicted to drugs, who has committed mm -hmm. a crime, and you have a choice. You can go to jail or you can go to drug treatment program. The, the, the nonprofits in San Francisco were like, you can't force them into drug treatment programs because it goes against, and I quote, bodily autonomy. And I was like, wow, so in three years, we've gone from you can't make someone who committed a crime go to a treatment to, I want to jab you because I want to yeah, jab you, we, right? Something's definitely going in the wrong direction where, like you said, permissiveness. We're just tolerating things that we should uh, as a society there are social norms and there are there are constructs right and so the question i saw we're running out of time but the but the question is like if you had a friend who was addicted to heroin and you were trying to help them like would you bring them into your house and then supply them with the heroin right no no because that, so we why know. are we as a society suddenly saying when it's when it's these nameless individuals we're just going to let them do what they want. That is yep. insane, and we need to stop. Before we run out yep. of time, one more thing. On Thursday, we also have CACR 32. Sorry. That is a constitutional amendment that is being suggested in order to declare independence from the federal government, who suck. So if that's an <laughs> issue that you're interested in, you can look up the language. It's a very short constitutional amendment. How this would work is it would be on the ballot. No one's forcing or deciding for anyone else this would be up to granite staters to say, yes, we would like to peacefully go our own way and become a prosperous, independent, free state. There you go. If you have any suggestions, comments, um, hate mail, whatever, <laughs> um, you can email us at manchtalk at gmail.com. Obviously, you can watch this on Facebook because you're, if you're watching it right now, you're watching it on Facebook. Um, our show repeats multiple times on uh, Manchester Public Television. And Carla does an amazing job because I totally failed it, um, uploading it to the cloud. I'm not even sure where anymore. Uh, you could go to my YouTube channel, <laughs> Carla Garrick TV. Um, that's all we got. We'll be back next week. Stay warm. There's no snow in the forecast. Uh, we're pushing into February with very little snow. Bye, guys. Bye.